just going to um, introduce a bit more technicality into it in terms of how I break this down to try and get my producers to think about how they can really measure what the bang they get for their books, basically. Because it's all right saying we're not very, in it, we're not very efficient. It's all right saying we're not a very profitable industry. But where on earth do we start in terms of being able to uh, identify where the biggest gains are going to be for the individual, okay? And, and an individual, you will all have slightly different solutions. There's no one solution. It's a question of finding out where you're going to get the biggest gain, if you like, where your weakest links are and where your strong links are. Um, so I think where we start is we've got to ask the right questions, okay? I've got a little trick up my sleeve for later on. I think I'll save it for this afternoon. Um, but I find, you know, the technical solutions, the answers, the technicalities are out there. So, you know, there's webinars now. Um, you can go on, I mean, AHDB, you could access some of our websites. You've got your own website, some fantastic information coming through there that Robin um, highlighted earlier on. Um, but unless you're asking the right question, you're unlikely to find the right answer. So... I think this is really where we need to start. In the days when I first started doing this job, we didn't have the internet and so on. And, and the vet, our veterinary profession is all often saying, I did quite a lot of lecturing and CPD for vets, and they will bewail the fact, and I can understand it, that particularly when people have got small animals now, they'll come into the surgery and they'll say, put the dog on the table and say, right, okay, I've been on the internet, and this is what I think's wrong with it, and this is what you need to give me, veterinary, to make it better. Now, that never used to happen. You used to take the dog in and the vet was God, knew it, and the vet was allowed to do the diagnosis and do their job properly. Game changer now. That's not how it is. And it's a bit like your consumers and everything else. They can go on the web and the first thing they see is what they will believe. Yeah? So information and technical information is not a problem anymore. You can Google it now. I can Google it now, you know, and answer this, that, and the other. But is that the information you need? Are you asking the right question? Okay, so that's really what I want to do in the run-up to lunchtime, is to give you a, a little feel for how I try and break it down. Okay, so the first thing I, I would say, and, 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 in, and I know a lot of you are using um, electronic systems and so on, um, we're obviously using them as well. We use EID now. We have to trace. We're supposed to trace everything with EID. Um, that's another story. Ask me at lunchtime. Uh, but this sort of kit is what I would use on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, this guy, we're using five-way auto drafts and all singing, all dancing. Absolutely fantastic. I can condition score, log, weigh um, 700 U's in under three hours. Yeah. And that's me, and I'm not fast, okay? I'm probably the fastest condition scorer in the country, but that's, that's another thing. But, um, so... One of the things that we can do now with this is, for the first time, and I'll show you a few more graphs uh, as we go through the day, um, is for the first time we can look at growth rates of lambs, big numbers, big numbers. We can weigh them lots and lots of times, and we can look at what the growth curves are doing. But there's a danger with this, um, and the danger is you have to be careful you don't drown in your own pool of information. So I've spent, um, and, I'll, I, and my last little bit of talk this afternoon before we finished is really um, uh, down to that, is that we, I've spent probably the last five years working with what we call our key performance indicator project, trying to just get some software that will do something other than just record thousands of bits of information and chuck it back at you in a useless format. Okay, now I don't know where you guys are with that. Um, I think a lot of you use Shearwell, yeah? Yeah, okay. So, so you, you're in the same place as me. I will say no more, okay? Um, it's really, really good at recording the information, but getting it out into some of the formats that I'll show you later on is, is, is quite difficult. So we, we, we have the technology, but we've got to be really careful, again, that we ask the technology the right questions. Now, I'm going to talk about cost of production now because I got started this off. I've been doing this now for probably about 17 or 18 years ago, I got absolutely heartily sick of looking at gross margins per U and trying to make that into something that, as a consultant, I could use to guide a client towards how they could improve their output. Because it's a pretty unwieldy, un un unhelpful way of looking at the profitability of a sheep flock. And I'm going to try and convince you of that in the next half an hour or so, um, that there's a better way of doing it. So profit then, dead easy to say, is the difference between the price you get 
and the cost to produce it. Okay, you all know the price that you get. We'll look at that though in a minute because that's not exactly fixed in, in tablets of stone either. The bit that we're weak on is knowing what it costs us to produce. So how do we actually get there? And basically what I've done is just try to break this down into three areas for you to think about. We can only have a quick flick through some of the headlines this morning, but again, it just, I find, helps with my guys um, to get us to get to, towards a cost of production. So we can break it down. We've got output. So if I was producing cars or jam jars of jam or whatever, one of my lads works for Jaguar Land Rover, and you know Jaguar Land Rover, if he doesn't produce so many um, Range Rovers off the production line in a week, then he knows he's not going to be as profitable if he doesn't hit his targets. So a number of widgets or whatever. Yours in sheep production, I would say, and for my guys, it's kilograms of carcass produced per U per year. Yeah, that is our production index. Not lambing percentage, but carcass. Then we've got the costs involved. What are the costs? And we divide all of that by our production index. And then we'll just have a little think about price. The bit that all my farmers go, oh, but we've got no influence on that. Well, we'll see. Um, because they waste an awful lot of effort by not putting um, their mind to getting all of their lambs in spec or whatever. So I just wanted to um, just spend a little bit of time just throwing a few ideas out to you as to how we might actually tackle that. So our output then, our production index. And I've, if we've got time, I've actually got a spreadsheet we can play with and we can construct an Alberta lamb producer spreadsheet, if you like. Um, carcass weight per you per year. It might be that if you're selling um, lambs uh, at post weaning into somebody else as a feedlot, your KPI might be, your production index might be, um, live weight of lambs, so live weight of lambs wean. Doesn't matter. What is your production index is number one, so challenge you to have a think about that. And then what we do is, suddenly when you start looking at that, instead of just looking at lambing percentage, you start looking for this kilograms of carcass. You start to build up sort of matrices in your mind. So with this one here now, what we've got is the number of lambs sold per you across the top. So some of our lower producing flocks at 1.2 lambs sold up to 1.8 and carcass weight down the side. And you can see within that matrix that you've got all sorts of potential production indices. Now for us, I would be looking for a minimum of 30 if I'm going to get anywhere towards a sheep flock wiping its face. I don't know what yours would be at all. Worth thinking about what it might be. But you can see already within that there's more than one way of getting to the same answer. So whereas in the past, just using the old gross margin, oh, lambing percentage reared, lambs reared really matters, and driving towards higher and higher and higher rearing percentages, which invariably mean higher cost, higher input, higher risk in some situations. Oh, I don't know about you guys, but my guys, I'm scanning results in the other day, and he's got 600 sets of triplets and quads to lamb. Not funny. Whereas if you can look at that production index and think about enhancing your overall carcass weight to do it by using some breeding, by using better feeding, by using efficiency, it puts a different complexion on it. It changes the question, yeah? Okay? So already we're starting to think in terms of things that we can have an influence on rather than just this big scary monster which is rearing percentage, which on its own doesn't mean anything. It really isn't an efficiency factor. This takes us to something a bit nearer that we can use. And then we can sort of start building other things in. So this, what this one does is, along the top now, we've got the production index. So kilograms of carcass produced per U per year. And down the left-hand side, we've got overhead costs. So I don't know what your overhead charges are. I know on the figures that Robin sent me, I think there were labour charges of £20 on feedlot lambs on those figures that you sent me, Robin. Um, but, I mean, hours per ewe, a breeding ewe, will vary somewhere between £50. So what's that going to be? Um, £100. You're six, about 0 0.6, isn't it? So how many is that going to be? It's going to be about $80, 80 Canadian dollars, something like that. Yeah? So 50 up to £80 would be our overhead cost per ewe. 
And then we can start to, and if you just take a system where all the variable costs are the same, we can then start looking at the interaction between overheads, production index, and cost. And you can see there that at 50, overheads of 50, and an output of 25 kilos, you're looking at 395 pence a kilo as being your break-even point, whereas if you actually go up to 30, you're knocking nearly 60 pence a kilo off your production costs, so long as you can do it by keeping your variables the same. That might not be the case. They might go up a little bit. But again, we start to ask the right questions. So a lot of our farmers were told for years, all you've, got, you've got to strip out cost, strip out cost, strip out cost. That's what you've got to do, and then you'll be more efficient. Well, when it comes to things like vet and med costs, the ladies at the back there were talking about vet and med costs. For me, if I look at a set of figures from a flock and they've got really low vet and med costs, I'm very unhappy. That's not a robust system. We start looking at the output. But what this enables us to do is to start looking at it in a what-if um, um, context. So if we spend another five pounds a U vaccinating them against X abortion and Y abortion, what do we need to get out of that? And actually, the win factor is pretty small, which is what the spreadsheet would do. If we've got time, I'll set it up at lunchtime, and then anybody who wants to have a look at it can have a look at it. And then we start getting into profit. Okay, so you can wheel that forward, and you can start to look at profit. And I only put this one in to really just underline the fact that don't take too much note of the actual figures, but the red is where they're losing money, and the green is where potentially they're making money. That I use this for my farmers to simply say to them, do not listen to the merchants who are telling you that the only way to be profitable in sheep is to effectively dog and stick it, get rid of all of the machinery and all of the labour and everything else. And we have a saying at home, you know, people gone easy care sheep, no such thing. When was a sheep ever easy care? <laughs> Easier, maybe, but for me that means efficiency rather than taking things out. What this, this actually shows you is that, again, you've got production index across the top. Remember, I'm saying 30 is kind of the watershed where I want to be, and then overheads down the side. Even if you strip out those overheads, so you go from, let's say, 60 down to 40, you've got to be really careful because if your output drops as a result of that, you can be seriously going from make ch chance of making something to the chance of absolutely making nothing or worse. Is everybody happy with that concept? Yeah? It's just a different way of looking at it that allows you to just start asking what if scenarios. Okay, so in terms of output, again, throw a few ideas out, but of course lamb losses are going to be a really important part of that. So, and I had this conversation with Robin, so I'm going to be a bit controversial now because I nearly fell off my chair when I said to her, oh, so how many of your producers pregnancy scan? Exactly. And they're not going to be able to do that if they don't do very many. I mean, our guys will do tens of thousands, and the accuracy is, I, honestly, it is, uh, Elaine will vouch for this, the accuracy is amazing. I, I, I was staggered. I did nearly fall off my chair. Well, I mean, well, I mean, big challenge, really, because, you know, I mean, there's no point in scanning if you're not going to use the information, I, you know, but, but using that information, I mean, for me, it, it's, you know, it is something which is just part of our DNA now, if you like, in that, you know, the feeding goes down to that. But also, in this context, uh, and we can come back and have a talk about that later on, but in this context, you know, if you look at where lamb losses are occurring, what this is saying to us is about a third of the potential lamb crop goes missing between when the ewe goes to the ram and when we scan. So in terms of pinpointing, again, asking this, how do we get to the right question, to me, it's absolutely critical, OK? Um, and then you can move on. So in terms of land losses, it's all about having those benchmarks in the sand as to where is this potential going? Where is the wastage? And then you begin to ask the right questions. So if the wastage is abortion and stillbirth and it's infectious abortion, I don't know what your situation is in terms of access to abortion vaccines, but we've certainly got good abortion vaccines. Again, my flocks, they just... It's just done. We, we just don't even think about it. It's done because we can't afford to lose those lambs. 
And then you might be looking at neonatal loss. I know there's been quite a lot of work you've been looking at interperitoneal glucose and all that sort of thing. Um, or it might be that it's losses post-turnout and then that comes to the predator issue. So if I've got a flock where we've got big losses in that post-turnout thing, we might be looking at the predator thing. We might also be looking, in a lot of cases, it's because they've not been mothered up properly before they were chucked out into groups of two and 300 ewes and lambs and they haven't learnt vocal recognition before they go out into that big group, and then you just basically they lose them. So, uh, again, it, it's, a, it's a about asking the right questions, OK? So when they're actually lost is really important. Um, you know, a young lamb, as opposed to these guys in this trailer, they were actually lost, they were about eight weeks old, and they were uh, doing really, really well for um, a reason, I can't remember the reason now, but they were brought back home into a field um, where there'd been a huge coccidiosis problem um, the year before, and it hit them like a brick wall. And that was after the vet had been, you can see that, if you look carefully, you can see veterinary's gloves in there, where he'd been having a real good do, and, um, and it hit them. So, you know, okay. The, qu the question was, how do we get around coccidiosis? Because we knew when the losses were. And we've got targets. Again, I don't know what your targets are, but without a scanning baseline, it's really difficult to know where the wastage factors are coming in. So overall, I would be looking at losses. These are true percentages. These are what you might laugh at these. I don't know. Um, but we would say anything less than 10% is low. So we might scan at 200%, let's say, as a 200 lambs in 100 ewes. And then we would say it's low if we lost less than 20 of those lambs from scanning to them actually leaving the farm or being reared. That would be low, okay? I don't know, how, how does that feel? Feel okay to you, okay? So very low. So low would be 10 to 14. Medium, 14 to 17. Um, you'll notice as we go through the day, I loathe the word average. There's, nothing, there's, there's absolutely nothing average about sheep production. Average is, if I put my hand in the freezer, or out there today, minus 21, and the other one in the oven at plus whatever, the average temperature might be okay. Not very good, though. It doesn't mean anything, does it? And averages in sheep production are the same, okay? What we're looking for, we want to know who's down the bottom. This is how we're using EID. We want to know who's letting the side down. And so uh, that's where scanning and so on comes in so important. High over 17% and very high over 20. And we've got a lot of flocks over 20. It's amazing. And a lot of them don't know. I got called out to one 18, mo 18 months ago. 3,000 mule ewes. Invested a lot of money. And the, the father knew there was a problem. And they'd listened to, uh, God knows who they'd listened to, but they decided they'd go from lambing indoors with a scanning of over 200% to lambing outdoors. Recipe for disaster. I worked out, I said, right, okay, how many years went to the top? What was the scanning? What did you sell? What percentage do you think they lost? Have a guess. 34. 34%. And this is in Oxfordshire on expensive land. Okay. So we've got them, okay? But the question for those guys is, number one, what are your losses? You don't need to look much further with a flock like that to know that that's where you start doing your first bit of work to get the big bang for the bucks. Yeah? But look at this one. Okay, let me just throw this one out to you. And this is where scanning really comes into its own as well. But in terms of for every 100 ewes in a flock, how many of them at the end of that season actually rear one lamb or more? Okay? What do you think? And this is UK figures. So you tell me what you think your figures are. You put 100 ewes to the ram. Of those 100 ewes, how many will be empty? Will abort? will lose their lambs at birth, or for whatever reason, will end up not actually rearing a lamb to weaning out of 100. My farmers, I ask them, and they'll all say, oh, well, it's probably around about 90 to 95%. On my data sets, it's more like 86. And look at the line, profit and productive use. It's a straight line, and it goes up at one hell of a rate. So uh, again, with a lot of our vets, a lot of our vets who want to get onto sheep farms to do more work, um, obviously it's chicken and egg because to get onto sheep farms to do work for vets, they have to be able to prove the cost benefit because otherwise they're not going to get paid for. I say to them, go for that guys, get some figures on that and do something about that because that profit line is an absolute straight line. Don't worry about the bells and whistles. They all get very excited about the bells and whistles. Oh, no, no, no. Just have a look at that. 
Okay, so unproductive use, lots and lots of reasons. That's one. You in normal position. <laughs> That's one of my clients' funds, and every time I use it, I think, God, I hope David's not in the audience and he doesn't recognise it. <sighs> Char it's a sh it's a Charolais. It's a big, soft Frenchy. No, who said that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite as soft as a Suffolk. Um, so lots of reasons for these unproductive views, and, and, and we haven't got time to go into this, but there are lots of reasons, and it's a question again of what's your reason? I don't refer to barren views ever. There's no such thing hardly. The number of views that are actually, strictly speaking, barren is less than one half a percent. Empty. Empty implies it's our management. It's our problem. There's something that we should be doing that we're not. And the challenge for my guys is to get to 1% or less. Empty use at scanning. And they can do it. But if you ask them, ask a group of farmers, what percentage would you be comfortable with having empty at scanning? Then I promise you over the years, the answer is between 4 and 5% will come back every time. What's that about? No excuse. Um, so lots of reasons, metabolic disease, losses. But the main one, I think, for a lot of people is poor records. Now, we've got the ability to be able to do this now with the electronics. Is There's no excuse for not at the end of the season being able to interrogate that software to say, right, who did what? And I'm not keeping her this time. So the classic is prolapse for us. So, you know, if she's prolapsed once, the chances are the beggar's going to do it again. Don't keep her. You know, particularly if you've got 4,000 ewes to lamb, you know, you, want, want, you, don't, you don't want the odd prolapse. You don't want 100 of the blooming things running around with harnesses on. So records, records, records. Absolutely critical. And again, it comes to, to and I've, I've put Baron in there because there will be the odd ewe. Uh, we, we have, um, we've been using the Inverdale gene a little bit in the UK. And um, the Inverdale gene is this... Um, yeah, she's smiling. Is this prolificacy gene? And if a ewe has one copy of it, it makes her extremely prolific. But if she has two copies of it by mistake, she's sterile. I've just got a bit of a problem at the moment with somebody who's been selling them sterile. So uh, that's not so good. Okay, aborted. Lots of reasons why we might want to cull ewes. Um, but cull them we must so again it, the answer sometimes can be really really simple we're not talking about high-tech stuff now but we are talking about the high-tech stuff to help us to do it so we're not carrying passengers really really important okay so i'm just going to give you a little example now of how you can use this approach to in, um, help people tackle a problem so robin tells me you do have some lameness here yeah Okay, so we have a big problem with foot rot. In the UK, we have just the right climate for foot rot. It's wet and it's warm and it's not uh, very good. And you can almost smell that foot from here, can't you? Whoa, I didn't half stink. But one of the things, just to show you, and, and I use this and we can plug it into a spreadsheet and so on, to show people how much more money they will make by addressing their foot rot problem, not tolerating the chronically lame and getting vigorous in terms of a foot rot policy. So some work was done about 15 years ago now, it's getting on a bit now, by um, Warwick University, and they looked at foot rot. So we know the effects of foot rot, so body condition, okay? I know when I'm body condition scoring 1,000 or 1,500 years, I do, and I've got the auto drafts running, I don't need to worry about where the lame ewes are because they'll all be in the thin pen. Yeah? All of them, okay? And that will affect fertility. We know that body condition will also affect lamb viability. We know that ewe viability will be affected. We also know that ram fertility will be affected because it will increase their body temperature and it will reduce their semen quality. And we also know that lamb growth rates will be affected uh, the interdigital dermatitis, which we would call scald. I can look at growth rates on some of my guys where the EID stuff's coming in and I can say, oh, well, you had scald that week. How did you know? I said, because your bloody growth rates have dropped through the floor. Yeah? So, but can we quantify it? That's the thing. I can tell you uh, all of these things. Can we quantify it? And what Warwick did was they, they quantified it, okay? Basically took a flock, split it in two. They really aggressively tackled the foot rot problem with targeted um, individual antibiotic treatment, culling in one half of the flock. The other half, they carried on as normal. I'm not saying the guy wasn't doing anything. He was, he was doing a pretty good job, but the other half, they left the same. 
And what they found was the number of empty use at scanning went down from 7% to 4%. Still too high in my book, but he was running at 7%. Okay. The number of um, dead use went from 5% to 3%. A dead use is an extremely expensive commodity, yeah? I mean, it costs us 30 quid just to cart the carcass away these days, never mind replacing the thing. Um, the number of productive use went from 88 to 93. Now, remember that graph. That's big bucks. Um, and the lambing percentage went from 1.57 reared to 1.78. So the extra output, and this is a few years ago now, they could more or less treble that now, but the extra output, would, they could put a cost on it. Now that for me is, 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 you know, that really does justify getting in and getting to grips with something like lameness because we can put a value on it and we can, I can put that through the spreadsheet and show somebody how much that drops their cost of production by and it's going to be a lot. Difference between making money and not. Okay, and the, treat the treatment costs are on there but I mean that's by, not by the by. Okay, so costs. We talked a bit about, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so costs. One of the pressures I said um, is that for our farmers, on the one hand, with things like vet and med costs, because vet and med costs are easily, people can see them, they can get them out of their accounts easily, and it's a figure and they go, oh God, you know, I've got to spend less. No, they don't. Whereas with feed costs, people don't always know what their feed costs are. Um, so with us, we can split down our variable costs into various areas, um, and we can see down the, this bottom one here on the right-hand side is um, feed costs. The big one there, the blue one, is replacement costs. You know what your replacement costs are? Does anybody calculate their replacement costs? Biggest single variable cost. Okay, brilliant. Um, biggest single variable cost, and yet most people don't calculate it or don't calculate it properly okay um, and it really again this drives this whole thing about having a, a young fit healthy flock because um, the temptation is when you're buying in replacements or you're having to keep females is the cost in your mind is the cost of the size of the check or the check that you didn't get for those females in the autumn yeah but that isn't your replacement charge is it your replacement charge is that minus the residual value of those animals that you actually got for them. And, and our residual value has gone up because um, our ethnic demographic, and we, a lady here, we were just talking about that at the break, that um, you know, they've put a really good market there for our old sheep. So the trick is get rid of it while it still has a good residual value before it dies on you or it lets you down. Okay, But it's really, and again, Records, 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 okay. So young productive flock is something that, you know, it's hard work because you're getting people to have a higher turnover of ewes, but this is really where we, we want to be driving towards. So you know, having those ewes and looking at it so that if they're going to have five crops, then their total lifetime output, we don't want anything to go wrong with that, okay? We really want them to have four or five seasons. That's where we would be. I, I don't know what, how many seasons you would expect them or lambings you expect them to have. But we want that all to go smoothly. If you end up, and we haven't got time to go into the details of this, but if you end up with ewes that aren't doing that, so let's just, um, Rob, I'm going to move out of sight just for a minute, okay? Um, if you've got these girls here, so here's our five crop ewe, and she ends up at the end of it being culled, she's made the maximum contribution to the profitability of your flock in her lifetime. But if she gets to that and she ends up in the last year being empty or barren, or even worse, she dies, she's really negating a huge amount of that contribution that she's made in the four years that she was there. You'd have been much better sticking at that and getting rid of her. Okay. Oh, that's a paper I published some time ago. If anybody wants it, I can give you... Well, I can't today, but I can certainly send it to Robin. But tackling this thorny issue of replacement costs. So it, it's all about what she's contributing, what do you get for her at the end, not keeping her until she's absolutely on the floor and even worse, dead. In terms of feed costs, I'm just throwing a few ideas out now. Um, cost per unit of energy, again... Grazed grass is about five, for us, is about five times less the cost per unit of energy 
than or grazed forage than buying in a compound nut or feeding barley's probably about three times more than grazed grass. So for us, a lot of our production systems now is we're really desperately trying to get back to being better grassland managers, better managers of forage. There's the two reasons for that. One's cost, and the other one is the sheep's a ruminant. And to feed a sheep ruminant as a pig is actually, for us, a problem. Um, might be something that you want to, to, think, to think about. So there's the shed that you saw earlier on. Um, and this, I put this up and my farmers all go, oh, God, we can't afford that. And I was saying to the guys at the back there, no, maybe you can't, but you try to get as near it as you can. The feed costs in that shed are negligible. I mean, we spend three pounds a ewe per year on just the minerals and a little bit of protein to go in with the forage. Uh, because the robot's there, the robot's up and down four or 14 or 15 times a day, we don't need a man to shove it up. She pays for herself, does Juno, in about three years. But our dry matter intakes are way outside of any book values. So the book values and the scientists will say they will eat about 1.6, 1.7 kilos of dry matter those years. Forget it. They'll eat 1.8 and they'll do that up to the point of lambing because the rumen is doing what the rumen does best. So I put that in there just to remind me just what we can do with forage. It's amazing. Um, and you've seen that one before. Another way of looking at forage, but, but keeping those costs down. So what we're really trying to do is to make much better use of this green stuff. And I know you've got your own limitations, but I was, I was heartened by a discussion I was having at the back there that you know, people are looking at perhaps other sources of forage. We're talking about grazing cereal, green cereals, whole crops, and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of costs and efficiency, you know, a ruminant is designed to be able to cope with that. Um, and if you feed it as a ruminant, it's amazing what you can actually get from them. So we're trying to move away from, and that's another reason, this is a friend of mine, Suffolk. So again, he'd shoot me if he knew I used it for this reason. Um, but we are trying to get away from this sort of situation where our terminal size are being fed on lots and lots of concentrates to ones that can actually function on forage. So we look at supplementary feeding now. As if we need it as additional or complementary, we get a grumpy face. Leslie has a grumpy face if somebody's doing it and they're substituting what we could have as forage simply because they're just not getting to grips with it and they're using... Um, so again, you're in a different situation because you don't have the growing season that we have. But I would just challenge you to think sometimes, could you actually... Um, have a bit less grumpy face, um, and you know, not so much substitution. In terms of vet and med costs, I think I alluded to the fact that, you know, again, if you're looking at it from a cost of production point of view, and we're looking at this output thing and what we're getting for it, I can quite easily justify to my guys that the cost of abortion vaccine is roughly um, taking down the number of um, ewes that fail to rear lambs by just over 1%, and you've paid for toxoplasma abortion and an enzootic chlamydia abortion um, in that flock, absolutely hands down. And we can demonstrate that in terms of cost per kilo and additional production index. So again, it's about how can I afford not to in that case. And we'll cap, perhaps if we've got time this afternoon, obviously worm control is a major, major issue to us. And you were saying at the back there that antelmintic resistance and so on. You know, an uncontrolled worm burden, those guys, they look really, really happy, but how do we know we're not losing 50% of their growth rate because of an uncontrolled worm burden? We don't. They're not scouring. They're not sick. They don't look... But they can, we can be losing up to 50% without any clinical signs whatsoever. It's a major problem to us. Uh, well, like I said, I've spent half my life doing it for the last 15 years. So, um, and, and for all the reasons that those guys at the back were saying, we've still got a lot of work to do with the basics. Um, so one of the things that we... So we're looking at... Grow, we'll come back to lambs later on. But this is um, one farm. Um, so the software on the left there, you'll see some of his body condition scores later on. 2013, growth rates, rubbish. Up to eight weeks, they're going all right on the left-hand side there, and then after that, they're all over the place. They're pancake. And one of the big issues there was he had antelmintic resistance on that farm. He didn't realise, um, 
And so the following year, one of the big things that we did was, A, we started monitoring it, we were using faecal egg counting, we used effective wormers, and got the grazing management right, and the right-hand one looks quite different, doesn't it? Very, very different. The growth rates are much bigger. But I'll, I'll come back to that later. And then we've got overhead costs. So again, very, very difficult to calculate, um, but calculate them you must. So land cost, labour cost, they're the big, the big ones, the big scary ones. Um, but if we're going to look at this cost of production, we've got to have some feel for it. And I've said to you, ours are somewhere between 50 and 80 pounds per U per year. Um, be interesting to get some feedback as to what you think yours are. It's a very big part of our production costs. Okay, just a final thought. My three headings were output, costs, and price. So in terms of costs, what we're saying is we need to look at those costs in the context of that production index. What are we going to get back if we start to spend a bit more or if we spend a bit less, what might we lose? In terms of price, our farmers will say, oh, well, there's the SQQ, the standard quality quotation. I mean, what's it to me? I sell my lambs and I, that's what I get. I don't dictate what the market actually gives me. I've got no control over it. Well, we come back to this dreaded average word, don't we? Because if you then delve into what's actually happening within a flock, what you're really looking for is, well, how many of your lambs are you throwing money away with because they're out of spec? Yeah. So this is just one quick, a couple of quick examples. This is one of my flocks. I, I was there, where was I there? Tuesday this last week, actually. And so they would have sold uh, as about um, 9,000 lambs worth in those two years, I think. So in the purple year, when we looked at what their weight range is on, this is just looking at weight in this instance. When we looked at it then, what we found was we were looking for 19 and a half to 21 kilos is where we wanted to be because we wanted that production index, but we weren't being paid over 21 kilos. So if you sent them a 22 kilo carcass, you'd get paid for 21 and you were gifting the processor a kilo, okay? Doesn't sound very nice, does it? But that's the way of the world. So when we looked at it and we said, right, let's actually break down. The average, the dreaded average, was fine. The average was about 19.6 kilos or something. So if you just worked on average, you'd said, well, what can I do about it? Well, it's pretty obvious what you can do about it. A, you've got to start paying more attention to when you're drawing lambs. These were being creep fed, so they were eating their heads off towards the end. And you know, at the bottom end, you want to actually try not to, in the same process, increase the number that are too small. So the blue boxes are the next year when we tried to do that, and we did knock down the number that they were giving away. Slight increase in 17 to 19, so the average carcass went down, and if that's all you were looking at, you would say, well, that wasn't a good move, Leslie, was it? But if you looked at the money that came in and the feed costs that we didn't have, it was more profitable. Okay? So it, it, sometimes it's just what information have you got and how can you split it out and use it. Now this is another example. So our lambs are sold on the basis of carcass weight and then we also get um, a fat class. And you probably laugh at this if you don't realise, but our fat class is judged by eye. Okay, you use probes, I think, don't you? Okay, so we have a guy on the line. Yeah, so we have abattoirs killing thousands of lambs in a day and there's a guy on the line and he's doing it by eye. Mm. If he's had a bad night or a row with the missus, look out. <laughs> and he's also doing by eye confirmation. So we have this confirmation grid. E is really good and P is absolute rubbish and everything in between. So what we're looking for, our base carcass is an R3L. So fat class 3 and an R confirmation, which is right smack bang in the middle. And basically this is a trial that I did. And so what we've got there is um, EUR and the different fat classes, and then an O is pretty poor confirmation. So we don't want four Ls, we don't want Os, we really don't want three Hs, because the chances are he's not getting base, he'll get base minus five or ten pence a kilo. We want most of them in that EUR three L. Now, the little um, cream-coloured bar there is where we started before the trial. So we got two previous years' d data from the abattoir he was supplying to, and we looked at it, and he wasn't very impressed because he thought he was doing quite a good job. And clearly he wasn't, okay? Quite a lot of O's. He was also, you know, three H's, really not hitting that target with enough lambs. 
So then what we did was he used high-index RAMs on half of his ewes, and he carried on with his own ewes on the other half. So two morals in this story. The high-index, which are genetically superior animals, are the blue bars. So the blue bars had it. Yeah, they, they came up with the best results. But look what happened to the purple bars. The purple bars are the same animals as the cream bars. What, what happened? What was the difference? Simply because he knew, simply because he had the information put in front of him that he was throwing money and potential away and he had some help in drawing his lambs better, in scoping it better, in managing it better. That's all it was. No change in genetics, no change in system, no change in anything else other than he was paying some, atten some attention to it. And he made a lot more money. So I I'll leave you to have a think about that. Now, I'm going to leave you with this one for lunch and then we'll go for lunch because I've been to New Zealand a couple of times in the last um, few years. I think it's about five years actually since I was last there, which is about time I went again. Um, and when I was out there, I spent the first time I spent a day in the Alliance um, Abattoir down on South, uh, South Island, which is one of the two biggest ones in New Zealand. And they have got a system there called Viascan, which is basically, um, a th a, it was 2D then, it's now a 3D imaging system whereby they actually use algorithms and computer imaging to assess the meat yield in a carcass. And I came back and I've screamed at our powers that be. We've actually, uh, that project I showed you, we actually had one in Wales and I was involved in doing the algorithms for it. But if you talk to the powers that be, they all say, oh, the farmers won't wear it. And the farmers all say, but we want it. Um, but what they were doing there is the carcass goes in, it, it, it's t pictures are taken of it now in 3D, the computer has the algorithms, and what it's coming up with is total meat yield. Isn't that what we want? Meat? Don't we want to sell meat? And then it's got three, the primals, so it's got the leg, the loin, and the shoulder, and it actually says what percentage of the meat is in those three things. So two great things is you can value that carcass a lot better. You guys need this, I'm sure you do, just like we do. But also, that changes for different markets, so it's not necessarily that you always want it all in the leg or all in the loin. Sometimes, so you can actually, and what we did, we were looking at grids and we were putting um, cost-benefit grids in according to where those percentages were. But for me, this is a game-changer. We've got this stupid system that was never even designed for sheep in the first place. It was designed for cattle, the, the Europe grid. Never designed for sheep. Ridiculous. Um, that relies on, yeah, we get the weight, but it relies on some guy who may or may not be in a good or bad mood. And it's really interesting, because if a producer goes to the abattoir on the day, and you're in the abattoir when your lambs are being graded, oh, oh quel surprise, suddenly your gradings are a lot better. Yeah? So we've got this stupid system, we're killing 300,000 tonnes of lamb a year, and we're not using this technology. Yeah? So I'll leave you with that thought. <laughs>